And now for chapter 14, to the chief musician, once again, um, I love that title. He's referring to God as the greatest musician. Imagine God singing a song, a psalm of David, where he begins, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Notice how the fool says it in his heart. He doesn't even have to speak and say there is no God, meaning in his secret thoughts or within himself, what he is afraid or ashamed to utter with his lips. Just as the Treasury of David commentary notes, the atheist is the fool preeminently, the greatest of fools, and a fool universally. He would not deny God if he were not a fool by nature, and having denied God, it is no marvel that he becomes a fool in practice. Sin is always folly. And as it is the height of sin to attack the very existence of the Most High, so is it also the greatest imaginable folly. But as denying the existence of fire does not prevent its burning a man who is in it, so doubting the existence of God will not stop the judge of all the earth from destroying the rebel who breaks his laws. Nay, this atheism is a crime which much provokes heaven and will bring down terrible vengeance on the fool who indulges it. The Hebrew word for fool in this psalm is nabal, a word which implies an aggressive perversity, epitomized in the nabal of 1 Samuel 25, 25. And if you'll recall, nabal was the wealthy man in whom David and his men sought help from. It wouldn't have hindered nabal whatsoever to aid David and his men, just give them a little bit of food. Saul was hunting David. He was wanting to kill him during that time. David was in a very desperate situation and Nabal refused him and even mocked him for this and much like the Pharisees during the time of Christ's ministry on earth Nabal a true fool and if you're wondering why I'm harping so much on this very first verse you know Stephen get on with it well there are a few other details that I'm going to get to in this chapter but for the most part this is just a focus on the foolishness of atheism, and I really like David Guzik's note on this. The God-denying man is a fool because, number one, he denies what is plainly evident, all of creation. He believes in tremendous effect with no cause. He denies a moral authority in the universe. He denies this, the very core of human nature. He believes only what can be proven by the scientific method, that of physics and chemistry. He pays no heed to that of love and justice and other profound qualities in which make us who we are, such as consciousness itself. The very fact that you are you is uh, something that science, they have no idea about. But anyway, he takes a dramatic losing chance on his supposition that there is no God. This is why the Apostle Paul says that creation itself renders a man without excuse. He refuses, last note, he refuses to be persuaded by the many powerful arguments for the existence of God. Such arguments include the cosmological argument, which is the existence of the universe means there must be a creator God. The teleological argument, which means the existence of design in the universe, that of order, if you will, means there must be a designer God. The anthropological argument, the unique nature and character of humanity, means there must be a relational God. And lastly, the moral argument, and there are many more than these, the moral argument, the existence of morality means there must be a governing God. So once again, only a fool says that there is no God. Verse 2, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? There were they in great fear for God is in the generation of the righteous. So God, he is the primary witness to this fear that lies within these atheists. They were not calm in their belief that there was no God. They endeavored to be. They wished to satisfy themselves that there was no God and that they had nothing to dread, but they could not do this. 
In spite of all their efforts, there was such proof of his existence and of his being the friend of the righteous, and consequently the enemy of such as they themselves were, as to fill their minds with alarm. People cannot, by an effort of will, get rid of the evidence that there is a God. Even whenever I was an atheist, I'm speaking first-hand experience. I lived that life. And I'm telling you, deep down, you may try to suppress it all the day long, but deep down, you know there's a God. Deep down, it's always just like this little ache in the back of your brain just telling you, you know there's a God. You know there's a God. You know there's a God. You just don't want there to be a God. In the face of all their attempts to convince themselves of this, the demonstration of his existence will press upon them and will often fill their minds with terror. Verse 6, ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad.